Everybody loves a good theme song, including us here at The Producer Podcast. That's why on today's episode, we're looking at the musical realm of filmmaking and what a producer should know about the musical process. To do that, we're joined by composer Benjamin Botkin. So without further ado, let's get started. Thank you for coming on the show today, Ben. Thank you for, uh, for having me. It's a real pleasure uh, to, to get on here and ha- have a discussion with you about this stuff. So, and I've heard you talk a couple of times at some film festivals and that, but maybe take a minute to just kind of introduce yourself and some of what you've done in the film industry. Yeah, so my name is Ben Botkin. Um, I am a composer for film, visual media stuff. Um, most of what I've, um, most of my learning and experience has been on feature film stuff, but in recent years, there's been more video game composing, um, documentary stuff. I sometimes write music for, um, uh, virtual instrument developers, kind of helping them with their products. But most, most of what I've done has been in, uh, sort of the indie, indie film scene. And uh, a couple of years ago, I also released a, um, a, an educational site to help other composers who are maybe a couple steps behind me to take the next step in their careers. Uh, so that's called uh, ForteComposerAcademy.com if you're going to go there with a the website. So on the business sort of music vocational side, that's kind of that's kind of who I am, what I do. Um, I'm also married and I have three little boys and uh, their ages seven, eight and nine. So life keeps me busy and that that uh, work life balance is always always a thing I'm uh, like like uh, like most working professionals is like, how do you how do you do that thing? Is that a thing that can be done? Yes. <laughs> and how? <laughs> so that's just a little bit about I guess a little bit about me. So, and I realize this, I don't even know if there's a way you're able to answer this question, but uh, is there any type of like average timeline for how music, uh, like for the post-production timeline, how, like how that plays into it all? Yeah, well, the biggest factor is something that's out of my control and that's just how much time there is for music and also like there's how much time I love, you know, it's good to have, and I'll get to that in a moment, but a lot of time, the reality is just, look, here's how much time we have, what can happen in that amount of time. And sometimes it's not ideal. Um, Sometimes it's, you know, often it's like a real time crunch and you're like, okay, how can this happen? (laughs) Is it possible (laughs) for this to happen with, you know, where I can still guarantee a product, but also I, I don't die more than normal mm-hmm. in the process of doing it. Um, so that that's, that's probably the main just logistical factor is when it needs to be done with, according to the project. And then I'll come mm-hmm. in I'll, and say, okay, is that something I can make work? But since you're talking to producers, it's, it would be a good idea to educate them on, you know, how much time is realistic to allow for composer to do his thing. So yes, uh, how much time does it take to write music um that's also going to be a little bit of a flexible question if you're talking about film and um uh film scoring for you know indie or studio films there's kind of various pieces of um various notions you hear floating around like one one piece of one quote I hear a lot is from John Williams, and he says, on a good day, he can write two minutes of, of music. So if you just use that as you're estimating, you know, okay, two minutes of music a day, you know, a 60 minute score, you know, if you just, if you do the math that simply, you might think, okay, 60 minutes of music for a drama, let's say, should 
you know, take a month because that's 30 times two. Now, there's a lot of other things that go into creating a soundtrack. You know, there's the actual composing process, but then you're also producing the music. You're sending it back and forth to the director for tweaks. Mm -hmm. There are sometimes delays there. There's all the initial prep and R and D. So there's kind of an extensive process, you know, beyond just the composing. And then there's some guys. So, so I guess what I'm saying is that two minutes a day, I find to be a, a fairly optimistic um, estimate when you take into account all of the other parts of the process. But on the other end of the spectrum, there are guys who write for TV and TV composers are often super fast and economical in their writing and in their process. And they'll sometimes have to write, you know, several minutes a day. So it depends, it depends a lot on the complexity of the music, the complexity of the, the project. Cause if it's like, um, a lot of really atmospheric drones and underscore stuff that you can just use with the virtual instruments in your computer, synths in your computer, then yeah, you can crank music out pretty quickly. If it's gonna be more complex, like orchestral, really thematic and detailed stuff, that's gonna be a little more, uh, uh, it's gonna be more time involved. And then also if you have to record or if there's a bunch of music team members where, you know, like if I compose the music and then prepare it for an orchestra, you've got the recording date. so. There's a lot of moving parts here. Yeah. In general, I like to say, you know, it's good to allow at least if you, if you have the option, at least two months for the scoring process. Okay. But it's going to depend on how big, how big your film is, the style of the music. So more specific numbers than that, you know, it's just really going to depend on the project. If it's super minimal um, and you know, the music is not um, super elaborate and maybe the film doesn't need a ton of music. So, I mean, maybe it's something that could be done in a couple of weeks or a few weeks, depending on, um, you know, the unique scenario of the project, or maybe it's a project like um, King Kong, uh, Peter Jackson, King Kong. If I have this story right, um, Howard Shore was originally going to write the music for that project. Um, there were some creative differences between him and Peter Jackson. So he exited the project, but way into the, we like they were way into post at that point. So really non-ideal situation. James Newton Howard comes on and writes this new score in a matter of weeks, which I don't like really understand <laughs> like how that happens. It's, it's a very long score. Um, so composers, sort of have their ideals that they ask for, you know, can we allow this much time if we're going to be recording with orchestra, let's pad that out. Um, but composers also oftentimes find themselves in situations where it's just, okay, what's possible in this time frame? Mm -hmm. And if it's really a crunched emergency time frame, sometimes they bring on other composers they know to help write additional music, just, you know, to get it across the finish line in time. So it's kind of, a, it's kind of a hard question to answer. I, I like to ask for, um, you know, if it's just me doing the score, if it's like a dramatic film, I like to ask for two months or maybe a little more than that, if it's possible. I'll, um, cause that, you know, that allows time for usually that that's going to allow some time for those redos, allow time for delays, like, you know, medical emergencies, and that kind of stuff, but it's, it's really, it's so situational. It's, it's hard to give a good answer to that without a lot of specific information about the film style of music and what you're trying to do with the music production. For sure. Um, you mentioned kind of in there, you know, whether you're like the music's being written to be performed with like an orchestra or whether it's just being done in the computer are there, other than the budget, of course, are there other factors that producers should be considering when trying to decide, like, which maybe direction they should go for their project? Yeah, it's an interesting question because it's, 
there are some conversations that are, you know, very creative and it's just like between the, the composer and the director and the producer doesn't necessarily need to be involved, but you're right. If it comes to recording orchestra, you know, contracting a bunch of other team members, all of a sudden you've got, but you know, you've got to think about what does that mean for budget? What does that mean for schedule? Um, so something that usually will happen early in conversations is um, when I'm working on a project, there will often be some form of um, triangulation is probably not the right word, but sort of like three-way conversation between me mm -hmm. and the director and the producer to say, uh, like, hey, you know, director, what's your creative vision for this film? What do you want it to feel the film to feel like? What do you want it to sound like? And how close can we approximate that with, you know, my tools, my skills, my contacts? And then here's where the producer comes in as well. How, how can we accomplish that with then the funds that are available and the time that's available? And then it, just, it becomes a, um, it becomes sort of like a cost benefit analysis of all these things. So like with virtual instruments, um, and how far they've, they've, they've come, even orchestral virtual instruments. There's a lot of things you don't necessarily need to record a live orchestra for. There's kind of quality thresholds. You know, you can get it sounding 80, 90% good without an orchestra if the composer knows what he's doing. And so then you just have to have that conversation. Okay, okay, how valuable is that extra 10, 15% mm -hmm. to the project given the budget uh, and given the time constraints as well? So budget is a factor there, as you mentioned, because um, increasing the music team is going to increase the workload. It's, you know, yeah, it's probably going to increase the workload. It's going to increase the cost. Um, but then also sometimes the budget is not a constraint. Sometimes there are logistical or time constraints that make recording non, um, non-practical. For example, on Dune, you know, the big blockbuster Dune that just mm -hmm. came out with Hans Zimmer, that was happening in the middle of a pandemic. So the ability to record full orchestra and having all the musicians together was compromised, you know, relative to what's normal. So I've heard him mention that that real life restriction, which he doesn't usually have, although oftentimes smaller projects like I'm involved in <laughs> have that restriction, but it's, it's, it's for financial reasons often. So he's like, okay, since we have less opportunity to do that kind of thing, how can we maybe use a creative direction that really leverages the strengths of what I can do with software? And then maybe we can record some individual instruments uh, like to add color, to add interest, to add that, those human, you know, those human qualities, even though we can't do the big orchestra thing as you know, as easily as, as we would have been able to do at other times. So I don't know if that's an answer, but yeah, there's, there's a, there's a lot of factors that go into that conversation. And then it's just kind of a balancing act um, to say, you know, do the strings, will the strings sound good enough with virtual instruments or is it worth putting, you know, $10,000 down in addition to this to also record strings on everything, you know, or, mm -hmm. or whatever that figure is. So sometimes it, it, that kind of has to be a three-way conversation between the director, the producer, and the composer. Right. Um, Cause the composer might have a strong case and say, Oh yes, the strings just don't sound good enough. They really need to be real sounding. And the director's like, Oh, it's a nice idea. I'm torn. And the producer's like, Nope, we just don't have no, Nope we need that $10,000 needs to go over here or whatever. <laughs> like that's just not an option <laughs> or whatever, you know, whatever that figure is. It, it depends yep. on where you're recording, how much music there is. And so obviously like the composer is usually interacting more with the director. Um, but like what can maybe a producer be doing to help make sure that the right composer is being brought on to the project that, it's not only going to be able to deliver what the project needs, but work well with the director. 
maybe I'll share a couple of my experiences with how I've communicated with both. Okay. I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily an answer, but may shed a little bit of light on some of the you know, um, dynamics. So usually before the film is, is made, the director and I have some kind of relationship, some like we, we know each other. He's somewhat familiar with my music and he likes it. And I might be one of a handful of composers that he's interested in having write the music for his film. Maybe I'm one, maybe I'm a favorite, maybe I'm, you know, on a list of a, of a handful of guys. So at that point he may say, Hey, producer, I'm interested in Ben and these other guys. Could you just reach out and see what their availability interest, et cetera, is, you know, if we can make it work financially. So um, there've been a couple of situations where I, the first contact I had was with the producer who said, Hey, the director whom, you know, likes your stuff. Um, what would it mean for us to work together? Um, you know, what are your, what's your availability rates, interest, and here's our schedule, here's our budget, you know? So the producer and I will often connect at that initial stage and just see, like, is it even at all possible? Cause mm-hmm. you know, if I'm booked and it's just, okay, that doesn't need to be a one hour meeting with the director and the producer that can just be maybe a 10 minute phone call, depending on how for sure booked my schedule <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or not, or not, you know, um, there might be other factors or so, um, so often there'll be some sort of touching base with the producer just right up front being, and I appreciate producers because a lot of the time they're just very practical, no nonsense. It's like, look, here's what we have to work with financially. Um, here's our time frame. We're looking for this. We can't afford this or this or this. And then that sort of, inf- that sort of just bare bones, lay it out, lay it all out on the table. Information is helpful to me. Cause then I'm like, okay, so this is where they are. Like, what can I make work for the time, the budget, et cetera, that they have? Can I make it work? Mm-hmm. And if I can, or if I think maybe it can work like, yeah, I think we might be able to figure out a solution. Maybe fudge some things, maybe think of some creative options for this. Then usually um, like the director might get roped back in at that point. And then it's sort of more of that three-way conversation, you know, creatively, like how much music do you, like how much music will this film need? What style will it be? And then I'm kind of assessing more like workload, you know, cause then that's going to affect if I give a more specific rate to the producer or suggest, Hey, we're also going to need to allocate a certain amount for recording some new live instruments. Usually I'm talking to the producer early in the stage and through to the point where we figure out the particulars and we have a contract written and signed. And then usually by that point, the producer and I may not, may not um, correspond that much for a while, unless there's big schedule um, roadblocks that, you know, mess up his plans or mess up my plans. And then we need to reallocate, you know, you know, recalibrate on schedule, but often at that point, then the conversations with me and the director and it's the creative conversations. And we're saying, you know, what style of music, where does it go? Maybe I sent him music ideas. Um, and then the producer might, he might check in from time to time, just make sure things are going, make sure things are on track, make sure, um, uh, things are moving along. Sometimes the director might not be giving feedback. Like mm-hmm. there, there are hitches that can happen in the process. Like if I'm delivering music for feedback, um, but, uh, but I'm not getting the feedback quickly enough from the director or I'm having a hard time getting through to him because he's busy working on all the other aspects of the film, which is understandable. Yeah. The producer on some occasions, the producer might say, okay, yeah, this is really a priority. We're going to need to bump up, you know, how much attention the director is giving the composer for feedback. Although usually, usually that's been something the director and I have been able to just 
you know, work out between the two of us. Ideally, I wouldn't have to go behind the director's back and, and tell the adult in the room, hey, look, <laughs> have him write me back. <laughs> like, like, I'm waiting. <laughs> um, I, and then, like I mentioned, if there are roadblocks, if there are things that may affect the schedule, that affect people downstream, um, then it's a good idea for me to keep the producer, um, keep corresponding with him and saying, hey, here's a thing that you might need to know about, or here's a thing that could happen that might affect, you know, down the road a month, might affect the sound guys. Um, but when, when we're in that, but most of the conversation I'm going to be having with the producer is going to be kind of upfront and in that stage where we figure out everything that's going to end up going in that contract. And so that's probably the majority, majority of the, of the communication, the producer and I are going to be having is, is during that, that part of the process. You mentioned, uh, just briefly there about, uh, like if timeline delays are gonna, or things are gonna affect sound work down the line i'm just curious does the composer ever work much with like the post sound designers and sound mixers or do you mainly just like do your stuff and then just send the files off and they take it from there it depends on the project and on the team there are some situations where i come into a project like talking about like video game stuff, there might be mm -hmm. some situations where it's, they say, here's the brief, this piece of music needs to be written, it needs to be delivered here, it needs to sound like this. All right, and your first draft is due here, second draft is due here, et cetera. And in situations like that, it may be a very um, sort of cut and dry situation where I'm not communicating or coordinating with a lot of people, I'm just doing, I'm following a very specific brief. And I just do this and I'm given audio specifications and I just send it off. But when I'm working on a larger project with a team, uh, I mean, with, with a bunch of moving parts like a film or there is a video game that I'm working on scoring. Well, I worked on it some last year. I'll, I should be working on it more, some more later this year. Um, but on that one, you know, the, the coordination between the music and the sound is very important. You mm -hmm. know, there's going to be sound design things. There's going to be music things happening. So if I'm working on a project that's a little bit larger in scope, or if there's the opportunity to have some collaboration communications, I like to do that. Okay. To say not only, hey, audio guys, you know, what do you need from me in terms of delivery? But also there might be certain scenes or sequences where there's an interesting dance between what's going on with sound and what's going on with music. Mm -hmm. like maybe it's an action scene or something. And sometimes there, there will even need to be a three-way conversation between me, um, whoever's doing sound, doing the mixing and the director, where we say things, we have conversations like, you know, in this scene, which audio elements are uh, should be dominant, you know, because a lot of time it's the sound the sound effects are dominant over the music, but maybe it's a particularly emotional sequence, and we don't necessarily need to hear the footsteps on gravel, you know, as the dominant sound effect, you know, uh, as the dominant sound element. So. Um, but yeah, I, I do like to coordinate with the people who kind of come before me and after me in the process, mm -hmm. not only so we can give each other ideas, you know, on, oh, oh, here's a cool thing we could do together, but also, so I make sure, especially downstream of me, I'm like, um, to the sound guy, I'm like, Hey, I'm planning to have you deliverables by here. Does that work for you? Do you need them sooner? Do you need them later? Do you need something sooner? And sometimes there will be a delay of some kind upstream of me. Like there's a re-edit of something and I have to wait until that re-edit. Maybe there's reshoots and I have to wait. I can't finalize 
maybe three cues of music until after those reshoots. And I've got most of the music ready, but not those. And so then I might re-coordinate with the sound guy and say, hey, here's what's going on. Here's what's affecting. Here's what might affect you. Do you need all the music all at once? Or would it be helpful if I got you what is good to go? What is approved now? And then those last three cues as soon as they're ready. Mm-hmm. So I do, I do like to coordinate and um, part of it's for logistical reasons and part of it, part of it can be sometimes just the creative sharing ideas because we're kind of, we're working in the same environment, uh, which is sound. And sometimes sound designers have, or um, Foley guys have like great ideas for, oh, you could like, what if, what if I did this and then you did this and then you did this and I did this. <laughs> So I wanted to talk some about the whole budgeting process. Um, And like, I guess, are there like industry standards or things like that, that producers can use when they're just working on that initial rough budget for a project? Or is it just easier to talk to a composer about your project to get numbers on what it might cost? Yeah, uh, probably. Probably the best thing to do is to coordinate like with a composer and say, what's your rate? Or if you don't, if they don't have a concrete rate, you say, you know, do you have a ballpark rate? Our project is a, is roughly this. Here's some information about our project. I mean, if, and it might, it might depend at what, what stage you are in budgeting. It mm-hmm. might be you're really early on in the film and you're, what your budget is, is not very concrete. And so you're wondering, you know, how much should we consider allocating for music? Or it might be later in the process and the producer says, okay, like we, we know we have this much for music and that's what we have. And it's, it is helpful to me, like when, when the filmmakers have like a realistic like budget and they say, we have this many thousand dollars and that's it. Okay. This is what we can spend on music mm-hmm. and then say to me, okay, what can be accomplished for this amount? And rarely is that number like an ideal situation. So yeah. usually you're figuring out how to cut corners. You're figuring out like what's most important. How can we prioritize the effort? And there's a bunch of things you can do to, um, um, you know, lessen the workload or kind of re, re, re uh, focus the efforts in certain areas. So I guess if I was, if I was a director or producer and I was in the early stages of like planning my film, I would want to reach out to some of the composers who were kind of my, my main guys I would hope to work with mm-hmm. and say, okay, in an ideal yet realistic scenario, what would I budget for music for this? Yeah. And, and and maybe that figure is something you can build your plans around. So I, it's usually better, the more in it, the earlier in the process, you can communicate with your composers or composer, the better. Mm-hmm. It doesn't always work that way just because of, you know, life and stuff. <laughs> And probably everyone on the production is probably saying the same thing, you know, <laughs> talk to us as soon as possible. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they are. You can't talk to everybody first. So <laughs> someone has to be not first. <laughs> um, but um, composers are also fairly used to working in a bunch of scenarios and saying, okay, we have maybe if ideal is, you know, the music gets this many um, rounds of revision and the music is recorded with live orchestra and the music is mixed by this specialist over here. If that's our ideal scenario, but we only have a third of the budget for what the ideal scenario calls for. Mm-hmm. The musicians or uh, composers are fairly used to saying, OK, we can't do that. We can't do that. We can't do that. Um, so 
there was a film I I was in discussions to work with on uh, fairly recently. The project it didn't end up working out just logistically. It just wasn't quite the right fit. But that was a film where the budget wasn't quite where I was, you know, where ideally it would be. Mm-hmm. So there's a bunch of when that's the case. There's a bunch of different things that. Um, can potentially be discussed to be flexible with the budget on. Um, so when I'm considering um, budgeting, I'm thinking, okay, you know, I, I, I know roughly what our expenses as a family are. And I know, okay, I, here's what I need to make. And then I want, it's what I, what I want to make is also more than that. So that's going towards savings or whatever, but me just knowing kind of the the basics of what I need for like a month or what I Mm -hmm. need for two months kind of gives me a basement figure to know I absolutely can't work less than this and we survive. So it would have to be more than this if I'm going to be working this whole time. Um, so but there's a whole bunch of different assets in the music uh, and, and aspects of the music that can be discussed that affect the price. Uh, one thing is, is rights, and that okay. is who owns what. Um, so what, what's normative, and not all producers, well, I mean, it depends on how experienced the producer is, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, more experienced producers producers will know this. Less experienced ones might not. But when it comes to the rights of the music, what the composer creates belongs to the composer. So like the rights for whatever I create are mine. And then I give or you know bequeath. <laughs> I don't know, that's not the right term. A certain amount or type of rights to the filmmakers to use this music and their project. I've worked with some people where they assumed like automatically that when I'm writing music for the film, that it's the music is theirs, but that's not the case unless it's actually spelled out in the contract. Um, if the f- film, for example, wants exclusivity on the music to say, we want this music to be exclusive to our film and not appear in any other projects. Mm-hmm. then what that means for the composer is, okay, I can't monetize you know, that limits ways I can, monetize this music further. If the f- film doesn't necessarily need the music to be exclusive, then that might be an area where the composer says, okay, well, if that's the case, then I can, maybe I don't need to charge as much because I have the possibility of keeping this music in my library and licensing it to other films or other projects. I could monetize it elsewhere. Mm-hmm. So um, there's other assets like the soundtrack rights, you know, who, who has the rights to sell and monetize the soundtrack. So I will usually, when I'm talking with the director and the producer in the early stages, I will walk through every type of right and say, um, are we all on the same page on what is being transferred or not transferred? And what do you need? Like, if you want exclusivity on the music, just know that I'm going to have to, that's going to be a premium because I will not be able to monetize it elsewhere. A common scenario that I work out on lower budget projects is exclusivity on the music for a certain period after release. So okay. maybe it's like, okay, for the first year after release, it's exclusive to your film and I won't license it in any other projects. But after that year or after that two years, then I'll do whatever I want with that mm-hmm. music. Um, sometimes the producer director need to secure exclusivity because maybe they are um, trying to work with a distributor or they're not sure. Maybe they're trying to sell their film or work with a distributor and the person downstream of them might end up wanting the rights to the whole thing. So that's just something to keep in mind. If you're in those negotiations with the composer, that's one of the things that might affect do we really need this music to be exclusive or not? Because it could be that there's some distributors, there's some places who might buy your film and say, we 
are going to want ownership of the whole of the whole thing and mm-hmm. the music and we don't want the music appearing somewhere else so i'm not sure exactly how often that's a, a, a demand or not but i that's something i've heard of so i know it's just something to keep in mind yeah if you know you're going to be working with someone else trying to sell your film to someone else um so but I, I think for most filmmakers, they don't necessarily like knowing the films. Ultimately, I guess it's a question for them how valuable that is. Mm -hmm. I don't really see why most films need exclusivity, maybe beyond a certain window. So that's one value point that I'll discuss. And I usually push to keep the rights unless there's a specific reason for them uh, needing the rights in which case he'll say okay in which case it will be it will be more or it'll be less it'll be less if that's if i'm keeping keeping the rights to license my music elsewhere (laughs) another big thing that affects budget is as i said workload and workload can be determined by a couple of factors one is how much music is in the film so that's something I'll, I'll usually talk with the director in advance. And without trying to put a really specific number on it, say, hey, like, I can do it for this figure if I'm sure I can get it done in two months, you know, or, you know, if it stretches into three or four months, at that point, that much money is not paying my bills and I'm in a sticky situation. Yeah. So if we like keep adding music and keep adding music and keep adding music as we go along, then that's not going to work for me. And it's probably not going to work for the final deadline either. Um, so usually I'll have an initial conversation with the director and this is sort of a, a sort of creative and logistical and which is like approximately how much music is this film going to need and different genres of film have different needs. You know, if it's like um, a live action, serious relationship drama, it's probably not a lot of music. It might be like one third music or it might be like for that genre, oftentimes a lot of the music is licensed elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So that might mean that I have less to write, but it actually, this brings up an interesting thing that should be discussed. Um, I'll, I'll finish this thought and then maybe get to that one. Um, So things that can affect, how much I need to charge is work is workload, how much music needs to be written. You know, if it's 80 minutes of music in a 90 minute film, obviously that's going to be different than 25 minutes. So, you know, that's three, three times, three times the work. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing is just the style of the music is another thing that will be discussed early in broad strokes. You know, there can be changes You know, if there needs to be a little more music or a little less music later on, you know, that's okay. But the ball, the ballpark needs to be there for me to make my, you know, make, make a figure or figure out what I can justify financially. Um, So uh, regarding the style of the music, if it's like really uh, full orchestra, melodic, intricate John Williams music for the whole film, well, one minute of that takes longer to write. If it's atmospheric underscore with maybe a synth and a little a little piano here and there, that can, you know, that you might be able to write that 10 times as fast or five times as fast. So that's going to be one of the things I'm taking into account is style. Another thing that, af- that affects the size of the workload is how many revisions there are. Um, I might get a sense of that just by the director. If I've worked with him before, I might know, like, usually I get things pretty close the first time around. So usually I'll only need to plan X amount of revision time. Yeah. Sometimes I'll, I'll put caps in that on like in the agreement and say, you know, because this is a rush project or because this is a project that has such a small budget, it has to be rushed because <laughs> I can only justify putting four weeks or whatever on this project. 
then sometimes I'll put caps there that kind of are, are safety net on the workload. Like there can be one revision of this scale and then another one of this scale and then that's all. And if it's, if it's more than that on a queue, then it'll be like a work order and it'll be a certain amount extra per minute of music on top of our initial conversation. So um, those, those are some things that can affect the size of the workload and that can then affect, that affects how long it takes me to write. Um, also, if it's being recorded, that, that might actually add more steps for me. It might actually, well, it, there's a bunch, there's a whole bunch of factors. There's a whole bunch of factors there, but let's, let's just say that basically the amount of music, the style of the music and the revision schedule, these are three things that affect workload significantly to the point where, you know, writing one minute of music could be the work of <coughs> two hours if it's really minimal and it gets a green light right away, or one minute of music could end up being two weeks if it's really intricate and there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of feedback. So when I'm deciding my initial rate for the film, I'm trying to do sort of creative gymnastics and sort of creative prophecy, you know, looking down the line and say, okay, what do I think is probably going to happen? You know, it, and, and anticipating as many of those developments as possible. So mm -hmm. there are fewer surprises uh, for me or for the director or for the producer. Um, so, so in those, like in those early conversations, we'll rule out things like, you know, like director, it's just not realistic. If you suddenly decide, you know, I think I want wall to wall music and this film, like, but we talked about it being one third music. I mean, all of a sudden that's, uh, not within the, the, within the range of the conversation that we had. Um, and you know, that's just not, it's not going to work given our conversation or earlier conversations. So, um, now there's other creative solutions that you can use that can maybe lessen workload. Like, um, if you license a bunch of pre-existing music, you know, if there's a piece of music that fits somewhere. Maybe it's music that I already have in my library, for, for example, because I have a bunch of um, different pieces of music um, that I've written for other projects that I have the rights to. I might say, hey, you know, I can't justify writing 45 minutes, but for your budget, I can do 15 minutes of original and I can license, you know, 10 to 15 minutes of music that I have in my library. And if I do mm -hmm. that, and I keep the rights to the music and I keep soundtrack rights and I reduce the revision total, you know, the revision count, then I can do it for this small budget, you know, but if those things were not the case, there's no way I could do it for that budget. So there's, there's so many aspects, so many things that can affect if this is a one month project or a six month project for me. And then th that, that can be you know, very directly <laughs> and that relates to rates and <laughs> what's possible and what's not, what's not plausible or what needs five times the amount of music, uh, <laughs> five times the amount of money. <laughs> um, one other thing I do feel like I should mention that uh, another thing that's also not always, you know, beginner, beginning producers or directors don't always, you know, there could be some difference in assumptions. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, on, on indie projects, on beginning projects, it's often the case, or the, there's a common assumption that, you know, the guy you get to do the music is the guy who does all the music stuff. He solves all the music problems. He does all the music stuff. Yeah. Um, but on larger projects, it's usually a team and there's often multiple important music team members like the music site supervisor, the music supervisor is actually typically the person whose job it is to make sure that every musical problem has a solution. 
the composer might be the guy who's only creating the new original music for the film, but the music license, uh, sorry, the music um, supervisor is usually going to be the one who's figuring out things like, do we need to license music for this sequence? You know, for this montage, we want a song. Who's going to write that song? Where's it coming from? How much is, is that going to cost? So it's common for films to have a couple um, different music budgets. It's common, common for there to be an original music budget, also a music licensing budget. But that's at least something to talk about in the early stages with your composer because there can be differences of assumptions. The composer might think, oh, I'm just writing the original music. But there could be an assumption that the filmmakers have that's, oh, you're going to find the license, the music to license, right? Like the background music in this diner that's supposed to be jazz, you'll you'll get that, right? Like, or, or you'll create that, right? And the composer might say, well, that's not what com composers do. So that's, I mean, so that's that's one of those things to just make sure everyone's on the same page about when it comes to responsibilities and expectations. Because that's that's a place where I've seen um, miscommunication or just misassumptions by the two mm -hmm. parties a, a, a lot of times on smaller projects. So then, are there any common mistakes or maybe misconceptions you see producers having about working with composers? Yeah, probably. Probably most of them are ones that we've already covered, which is different assumptions about what the responsibilities of the composer are. Mm -hmm. And so that's all stuff that really should be ideally is hashed out before the agreement or sometimes in the process of creating the agreement. One of those comes up like, oh, you're doing that. I thought we were doing that or or vice versa. Um, but yeah, so common ones I see are not having a good solution for who's in charge of music licensing and solving that, where our music licensing budget is coming from. Um, it's also good. It's, it's also good for producers to have a little bit of a knowledge of just the, um, the composing process. I mean, it's good for everyone in film to have a, a basic knowledge of what everyone else in film does and how they do it. But, um, for the producer to have a, a basic knowledge of what the process is going to look like once the composer gets started, it's helpful. And there, are, there are some things that the composer will request. Uh, like I'll sometimes have in my in my agreements, I'll say, you know, we're shooting to have the film finished by this time window, but that will require that I have this version of an edit ready for me to write music to by this date. Mm -hmm. And that assumes that I have a spotting session with the director by this date. And if I don't have those, then I don't have the information I need to write the music and I can't have it done by this date. So if those things are discussed from the beginning, you know, rights to the music, whose responsibility it is to create what, how much money, when the money's being sent. Um, those, those are a lot of, those are a lot of kind of the, the main, the main areas where I see there being miscommunication on lower level projects. Um, those are the main things that stick out to me right now. Just when I think about that question. Okay. So then uh, my final question, and this could be, um, specific to the music and the score. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. Um, it could just be an observation you've had. Uh, but what's one piece of advice you would give to a producer about the post-production process? Probably check in with your director frequently and make sure your director is hitting the milestones kind of that need to be hit from this stage to this stage to this stage because mm -hmm. it's kind of like a domino you know, domino effect is not quite the right the right illustration but basically what happens here 
if this person's late, then this person's late. If this person's late, then this person's late. It's double late. <laughs> and it affects everyone downstream. So certain milestones have to be hit. It's it's like the uh, the book around the world in eighty days. You know, you can mm-hmm. make a, you can go around the world in eighty days if nothing's uh, everything's on time and everything uh, hits hits, and you have the the right allowances for extra time. So, depending on the experience of the director, the producer might just need to be that, and this is usually what producers are. Producers often need to be just that super practical like no nonsense we have a deadline to meet we have people to pay person to just come alongside and say hey this is not important and i i've seen some scenarios i think there was one product uh, project where i had to talk with the producer and i say i said the director is getting caught up on revisions of one or two cues that i don't think are even we haven't even discussed these as being key cues mm-hmm. and it's affecting my ability to move on and finish things up. So could, you know, we, could you maybe talk to the director or talk you and me and the director talk about how important certain things are as you get yeah. near the end. Cause it, when, once, once you get into creative mode and this could be true for the composer mm-hmm. or it can be true for the director, or you can start to get zoomed in on one thing and forget the larger perspective. So I'd say as long as the the producer is doing, you know, the producer job, which is just to make sure people have what they need when they need it. Um, And checking in with the director, checking in with team members. If, if he or she has reason to think there might be hiccups, those are all very helpful things just to continue to keep the, keep the project moving along without uh, too many, too many hiccups <laughs> for sure I, I appreciate producers because uh, i know it can often be kind of a thankless role you know you're always creative people trying to be creative and the producer might feel like well i'm the bad guy he says <laughs> no we can't afford that or no we don't have time for that but someone has to be that guy <laughs> yeah someone has uh, if those are those are very important people to to have on a, on any project, and if they don't exist, then projects never happen. <laughs> yeah, I've I've seen that happen before. That's for sure. All right, so we'll go ahead and wrap up this episode. But thank you very much for taking the time to come on today. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me, Micah. It's been a it's been a pleasure talking. Until next time, make sure to subscribe to The Producer Podcast, and thanks for listening.